that's me. I have no idea why, but my phone will only record upright tonight. Who knows why? So y'all just have to watch me this way. I think a lot of y'all watch me on the phone, so it doesn't really matter that much anyway. Uh, but I don't know why it's doing this unless Facebook has started something new that I don't know about. But anyway, for those of y'all just, uh, I had started it and because it was upright, I thought I would restart it. But no matter how many times I turn my phone or do anything with my phone, it's going to stay just like this. So, good evening, Rhonda <laughs> and Pat. Patricia, I don't know if you go by Pat or not. But anyway, uh, I've been reading, reading. Chris has been fishing. I've been fishing every day with him. And so he looked at me today and he said, are you going to go fishing with me? And I said, I really think I'll stay here. Um, so this is the most time I've had alone in quite a while. So I've been reading God's Word and I've been studying. And it's been very nice, I have to say. Um, so I thought, you know, I'll do Bible study before he gets home. I called him. And I said, have you caught a fish? And he said, I caught one even bigger than the one I had yesterday. But I didn't get it in. My line broke. And I said, well, that means you're going to fish till dark, don't it? He said, probably. I said, okay. So um, that's why I'm here with you ladies tonight. Finally, you get to see uh, me by myself instead of being in the truck with Chris or going somewhere and doing something. But we are still in Florida. Yes, we are. Um, but our Bible lesson today was about being close to God. And um, it's it's really good. I am reminded of times that I was out here. This is calling me now. I'm going to pause this broadcast just for a second. Y'all stay on. Do not do that. Okay? Thanks for, thanks for staying on. <laughs> he did not catch a fish, so he's on his way back home. Um, it's so funny because I'm so goofy. Gosh, when you get older, you just do the goofiest things. And y'all are going to see something goofy I did on Chris's next video. I'm so embarrassed. But I'll wait and let y'all watch it. But another goofy thing I did tonight was I was reading on my Kindle. I was reading the Bible study on my Kindle. Well, then I was reading the Amplified Bible on my Kindle, and I was thinking, you know, that I could do both on the, on the show. And I knew I couldn't do both, both, so I got my book out, and I sat down with my phone, and I thought, well, my Bible's on the, on the phone, on the Kindle. I can't read it while we're live. Lord, it's hard to remember everything when you get my age. And I'm just 50 this year, but y'all keep in mind that even if I'm 50, they say chemotherapy ages you 10 years. I truly believe that. So keep that in mind as you watch me. I may be 50, but my body's more like a 60-year-old, especially with all of the issues it has. So y'all don't think, and my mind is too, so y'all don't think that sometimes, I know y'all probably think, Something's wrong with me because I can't think of words and I do goofy things. But it's just the way it is. It's just the way my life is. But anyway, with that said, y'all watched Chris's next video. It's funny. Um, let's go ahead and do our Bible study. Hey, Mary. Hey, Kathy. Krista. Rhonda. Um, let's see who else. Helen. Marilyn. Marilyn, I hope you like that your pie made the picture of the week. It just looked so pretty to me. And at the time I just so wanted a piece when I when I clipped it out and put it on our uh, board. So uh, her, if you're not a part of Color Valley Cooks Group, which all of you probably are, but you can share the recipes that you make. The CBC recipes I like the most of course. And they're the only ones that win a spot in the highlight. Um, so if you do that and share them. It's nice to see them. Today is March the 26th, and we are going to be reading out of Isaiah chapter 6. And you know that Isaiah is a prophetic book, which means it's very complicated. And that's why I've been reading so much, because it's really talking um, about the, the actual scripture is Isaiah 6, 5, okay? 
and it says, and this comes, I don't know which version this is. I guess it's the KJV because it's not uh, referenced. But it says, woe is me for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I have, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And this is when Isaiah has uh, a vision and he's up really in heaven with God and the angels and the ser seraphim. The, the, there are seraphims and cherubims. And we've studied angels, but it's been a long time ago. So I actually um, went to Isaiah and I don't like to teach y'all anything if I'm really in a teaching mood. And not just reading the Bible study, that I don't go back and read it. Okay, and this chapter uh, talks about the angels, uh, well, the, the seraphims here. And so I find that interesting. I find them very interesting. Actually, they're really not considered angels if you really study it. Only the angels are considered angels. Okay, the seraphims are different and the cherubims are different. So, um, with that said, I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm going to read 1 through 5, but I'm going to put you in perspective. Well, no, I, I take that back. There's another reference to a scripture in the text, and it's actually out of Corinthians. Let me wake up my computer, because I have to read this off the computer. Oh, oh my goodness. Let me just read the study, and then we'll go back and read the scripture, because this is actually more study on God, and you're going to see why when we get to reading this, because this is called Close to God, okay? Um, and he's, that scripture is just letting, he realizes when he's up there with those angels, and he's in the presence of God, how sinful he is, and who he is compared to them, Okay? So that's when he says, woe is me, for I am ruined. Like, oh my goodness, don't even, you know, why am I even here? And it says, as times, at times, and of course this is Charles Stanley's words, uh, out of Jesus, our perfect hope, okay? And it says, at times you will grow closer to God, ridding your, hearts of, uh, your heart of idols, Renewing your commitment to him and shedding all that encumbers your relationship with him. Then suddenly, out of seemingly nowhere, you will be absolutely convicted of your sinfulness to the point of utter brokenness. And this is where he is, of course. And of course, if we were in the presence of God, we definitely would be, as Isaiah was. And it says it will be surprising because you will feel further from God even though you've been more dedicated to him. But take today's verse as encouragement. It is when Isaiah got close to the Lord that he truly understood his sinfulness. He was not being rejected by God. On the contrary, the Lord was readying Isaiah to draw even nearer. The same is true for you. The closer you get to God, the more aware of your sins you will be so he can free you from them. The discomfort is not forever and afterward. The discomfort is not forever and afterward produces a repentance without regret. Um, then he refers us to a book, which is Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. And the reason he refers us that, to that is because Paul the Apostle um, wrote to the church of Corinth because there was sin in the church and they were doing things that they were allowing things to happen in their church and completely ignoring the sin. Okay. Um, and, and keep in mind when I say that, I am saying the sin, not the sinner. Okay. But what happens is he writes them a letter, they read it, and they feel um, convicted, and their hearts change, okay? And when their hearts change, they make some changes in the church that should be done. So he refers us to this because he lets us know that the discomfort is not forever. Just like them, when they read the letter, they felt ashamed and sorry 
But afterward, it, re re it produced a repentance without regret uh, that will lead you to a deeper and more fulfilling experience of his love and all Jesus has provided for you in salvation. So he's letting us know that when this happens, it's a good thing and that it would bring us closer to God. And um, then his prayer is, Jesus, this pain as I draw near to you is difficult, but I trust you to set me free and draw me even closer. Amen. Okay. So I read, of course, Isaiah, which was about the angels. And then I, well, well the cherubim. And I read the second Corinthians. And, um, and that's what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about. Um, we're not really going to go to second Corinthians. I'm just going to stay kind of, uh, give you a couple of things. And that is, when I looked at that, if you go to blueletterbible.com, what is so good about it is that it has study materials and devotions. It has all kinds of things. And you can read every version of the Bible you want to see. So, like, if you're dead set on KJV, you can see it in there. If you want to see the King James Version Amplified, it's in there. The Amplified Version is the King James just amplified, okay, which is my favorite. One of my, you know, really it is my favorite. Uh, and, of course, they got all the rest of them, too. So, if you want to look at them side by side and compare them, you can do that. Whatever you want to do. That's what I like about it. It has commentaries in it. And keep in mind that commentaries are written by men, okay? And men are not perfect. And they are not considered Bible, uh, Holy Spirit-inspired words of God. They're just commentaries. So where you may go to one church and hear one version on something, you can go to another church and hear something else. Same deal with commentaries. But the Blue Letter Bible has um, been really good about only putting in those that they feel like they should. Okay? So, with that said, I, want, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to turn y'all around. And please don't just go away. I want y'all to see a couple of things. I'm going to let y'all look at my screen if I can. I don't know if this is going to work or not, but we're going to see. But this is the, the site, and you can see up here at the top, it has the tabs. And, um, and then it has your, you can tell the version you want to see in the Bible. You can type in the book. And so where, where we are now is actually... Under, oh, I messed it up. I'll have to go back. But where we are now is actually under um, Encyclopedia Dictionary. <laughs> so, um, no, actually, no, I'll take it back. I was under study. I was under study, and um, I went to Encyclopedia Dictionary to read about cherubims. But we are going to be into topical indexes. Um, and they have a topical analysis of the Bible by Hitchcock. And one is called, just give me a minute because I went out of it. Oh, this is not the same one I was in. Sorry, there's two different ones. Thanks for bearing with me. There's two different ones. There's Hitchcock, Hitchcock's Topical Analysis of the Bible, and then there's a chain reference special Bible reading. That's where I was. And because, you know, when uh, Isaiah got in the presence of God and he realized uh, who God was, um, that's when, his, when he was convicted. So what I was going to do is go in here where he's got the topical... Um, index, and I'm going to read some of God, some of the scripture about God and who he is. Just give me two seconds. I'm looking. I had it saved, and then when I turned it around to show y'all, my um, God's Ways, okay, that's what it's called, God's Ways. So I'm actually, if you want to take a look at it later, it's blueletterbible.com under study and then you click the tab, and there is a subject called 
topical indexes. And then under the topical indexes, you will find what I'm reading out of, okay? And this is God's ways, and he just gives scripture, okay? And so I'm just going to read this. This is Psalms 1830, and it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust him. The second one, Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, saith the Lord. This is Hosea 14, 9. Who is wise and he shall understand these things? Who is wise and he shall understand these things? Prudent and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right and the just shall walk in them. But the transgressor, transgressors shall fall therein. Everlasting, it says. Uh, Habakkuk, I think that's how you say it. It's chapter 3, verse 6. It says, He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. Inscrutable. Romans 11.33 Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. He is just and true in Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. And the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. So, I just thought that was nice. I thought I would, you know, just read you some scripture about God's ways. Um, he's so different than who we are, you know. And... Um, I just thought it was really good. Now, if y'all want to go back, we can look at Isaiah right quick. Isaiah 6. Go there, please. Okay. And I'm just going to read this because I, it's really cool what's happening here. Okay. And I just want you to kind of listen. And I know it's deep and it's a, prof a prophetic book. But it's still really cool when you think about what he saw, when you think about what's really up there. Because, you know, we live here on this earth and we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. But we're pretty much fleshly. We live a fleshly because we're walking here on the earth. We're not in the heaven. You know, even if our body is the temple of God, which it is, we are still not up there. We don't see these things how real they are. And so when I read this, think about how real this would be if we were there. Okay. It says in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims and each one had six wings with twain he covered his face. Of course, that's two wings. Covered his face. With twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, 
Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Wouldn't that just be amazing? Think about that. So up there, when he saw this vision, he saw the seraphim, which is an angelic form, uh, which guards kind of like the Holy of Holies. Um, and it is in Ephesians, it is in Isaiah, it is in Revelation, how these, oh, it's also in the Garden of Eden. They also guarded the door, uh, the entrance to uh, the Tree of Life so that uh, Adam and Eve wouldn't go into it. Or the Garden of Eden, I think, at the, the door of the Garden of Eden. Well, anyway, they are guards, okay? These these things, these beings, which are cherif cherifum and seraphims, are like uh, beings and they're guards, okay? And they are present everywhere God is, okay? So God was in the Garden of Eden, and he did walk with Adam, and he was there. These cherubims were present there. These seraphims were present. They were present there. They were present in Isaiah when he seen God. They were present in Ephesians. They were present. Um, I'll give you an example. When they did the, uh, and y'all know my mind don't work halfway right, but you remember when they had the uh, Ark of the Covenant, and they had to take it different places when um, the people were out in, um, they were trying to get to Canaan, into the land of Canaan, and they were out in the wilderness, and there was always smoke. Remember, the smoke was there. The smoke was there. The altar was there. They had the uh, cherubims that was part of that, you know, like part of that, covering it. When they had the... Um, I'm trying to think the um, temple where the the priest was. Um, they had a a statue type cherubim um, that's arms was open, uh, but then it had some arms that were down, kind of to like the arms were open inside the temple, but there was also two more arms that went over where God was supposed to be. And I can't remember exactly, y'all don't, you know, I'm sure some of y'all know the name of it. But anyway, my point is this. Those are there to guard, and they're there with God. And they go kind of, you know, they're all kind of together. There's always smoke with God. There's always this presence of these beings. And it's just really cool to me. Uh, and then there, and there was an altar. An altar with the coal that they picked up and put on his lips. So, um, it's just really interesting to me um, what we're going to see when we get up there. We have no, I mean, you know, a lot of us are just, you know, we want to see those who passed away. And we, we want to go see our mama or our grandmother or our sister or brother or child that we've lost. And we want to go see Jesus. But just think of all these things that we are really going to get to see when we get up there. We're really going to get to see these beings, you know, and these angels that God created. Because I'm sure that our representation of the angels that we've made here on the earth are totally, to, in my opinion, ridiculous because they're uh, people with wings, you know, and we want to pretend that they're somebody that was kin to us or whatever, which, you know, I'm not saying that there couldn't be a spirit, but they're not angels because angels are real. They're things that God made. And who knows, when we get up there, they may have a person's face. Who knows? But I kind of doubt it uh, since we were made in the image of God. Uh, but we don't know that. But what's so cool about it is we're going to see the streets of gold and we're going to see the mansions that he's built for us. We're going to see these interesting beings. And we're there's no telling what all we're going to see. And so if you've lost somebody, I know that some of you have. And like, and I, I know Mary is, is watching. And Mary, I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't asked you how your sister is because I'm so scared that you're going to tell me that she's in heaven. 
And it's not going to hurt me to know she's in heaven because she's not my sister. I'm going to rejoice knowing that she went on to be with the Lord. But my heart hurts for you. And since you haven't told me, and I don't know if you think because I'm on vacation, you can't tell me. Um, I'm just scared to send you that message. Does that make sense, Mary? So, I mean, you can let me know what's going on with her. And it's not going to bother me because I'm on vacation or anything like that. Because I have been praying for y'all, praying for her. And for all I know, she's up there with Jesus. And she's getting to see all this wonderful stuff, you know. Uh, and I'm hoping she is because she was suffering by a lot. And I wish that more of us could see the beauty in death because Jesus took the death part away. Um, I wish that more of us could, and I'm not saying that you don't, and I'm not saying that it's not normal to mourn at all and cry. Even Jesus cried when Lazarus passed away. Jesus, God himself in man form. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't cry. I'm just saying, and even if we rejoice, but so many people are scared to die, and you shouldn't be scared to die. If you are scared to die, then you need to think about your salvation and whether or not you really know where you're going, and if you're secure in your salvation. And if you're not, read the book of John in the Bible and see where you stand with salvation, okay? There's nothing we can do to earn salvation. There's nothing that you could have ever done to earn salvation. It's truly a gift of God. It's truly just having the faith to let Jesus come into your life and uh, love you. But now it does usually, I mean, it does say in the Bible that we are to be, um, y'all, this is how my brain works, convicted of the sin in our life he does send the Holy Spirit here to convict and prick our hearts to show us who we really are. So we have to realize that we are sinners and need a Savior in order to be saved. We can't just, oh, you know, just all of a sudden, oh, I think I'm going to trust in Jesus Christ today. That's not how it works. Okay. So uh, read the word of God. And if you are not saved, he will send the Holy Spirit to prick your heart and convince you, even if it takes a little bit of time. Um, one of the girls who watched me on here, her name is um, Donna Smith. I don't know if she's on here right now or not, but the last time we came down to Florida, I got to meet her. And uh, she was actually a Catholic, was raised Catholic, and her husband um, and her both were convicted at different times in their life uh, to learn more about Jesus. And they came to know Jesus as their personal Savior at different times. But both of them can tell you how they were convicted as an adult and what it felt like. And it was just a beautiful story to hear both of their stories of salvation. So that Holy Spirit does still work and convict people into salvation. That is how salvation should work. Now, I was saved as an early child, and it was just a matter of hearing the gospel. The, the, the Holy Spirit convicted me and and was showing me that I deserved to die and and that I needed a savior. Um, and so as an adult, it's a lot different. My husband was convicted as an adult. He went forward really young um, and thought he was saved and even raised his hand because he was worried about it one time. And his daddy said, oh, you're saved. What do you got your hand up for? Which we should never do, by the way. Um, and so later on in his life, when he was in his 30s, he actually come to know Christ. Um, so he was actually convicted many times, different times in his life. Not every day. It's not The Holy Spirit's not going to work on you every day. It's going to be different times in your life, and you just start to feel this insecure, scary, you know, reality of your sin and who you are, and you need Christ, Okay. And it's hard to describe unless you've been through it. So I appreciate meeting Donna. It was a blessing and her husband to hear their salvation story. I'd love to be able to post salvation stories on here. I mean, if any of y'all want to write your salvation story, 
um, and send it to me. I'd be, I'd be willing to share it on the page. Um, I would love to. So just send it to me, whether you email it to me at Color Valley Cook, no S, Color Valley Cook at gmail.com, or you just send it through Messenger. I'd be happy to share it. Um, it would be a blessing to some of us. And lots of times when people read your salvation story, they get saved. They really do. I remember I put Chris's salvation story in a women's, uh, like a little newspaper thing. And we had a man come forward and say he read Chris's story and knew that he had been under conviction for some time and he received Christ into his heart and was saved. So the uh, our salvation stories are very important. And they're different for everybody, and they're for everybody. And we shouldn't hoard them up and, and lock them up. We should share them. So if you want to share yours, that would be great. I'd love to get a bunch of them. I'd share one a week. That'd be great. So uh, y'all remember that. Um, it's just exciting to me to think about what all's up in heaven. And Mary, if your sister has went on to be with the Lord, I am happy she is there. I'm happy she's rejoicing and praising the Lord with and singing this holy, holy, holy that everybody seems to sing up there. Uh, if she's still uh, working really hard to survive in that hospital and I see you, uh, praying for her still. I'm praying for all of y'all. Um, and there was one uh, message in here that was about when we lose things, we actually gain. How the Bible teaches us loss is gain. And you can look at that through um, losing someone because the great thing about Jesus is that he conquered death. When Adam went into there, he was immoral. I mean, yeah, he couldn't die. But when he ate of the fruit of the tree of life, it brought on death, death for all of us. And when Christ died and he sacrificed his body, he made a way that death uh, does not have a hold on us anymore. So we really don't even die, y'all. We just kind of, because Christ keeps us going. So we, we leave this world, but we, we are in a world with him, which is a wonderful place. Um, so y'all just remember that. Sometimes, just like Paul said in the scripture, he said to die for me to, to, he died, like, he, he, ex, he explained, but I can't remember, but anyway, he dies daily for his flesh, but he even said to die is gain. To die, to die, your flesh is gain, that you would live more through the fruits of the Spirit, and be kind, and meek, and, all, and full of joy, and full of love, and all those fruits of the Spirit, I mean, there's plenty of them. You can name them. So to die to death is also gain because you go to heaven to be with God. And he even said, um, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. If it w were not so, I would not have told you. And remember, Christ don't lie. He flat said he was going to prepare a place. And he is. And so it's exciting to think about what in the world is, if this earth is as beautiful, that's what I think about. If this earth is as beautiful as it is, and I know I'm just talking on and on, but I was sitting there fishing yesterday and I was looking at the ocean and I was looking at the clouds going across the sky and the birds and the ducks and the trees and the grass, and you can just name it over and over and over. And people are beautiful. I mean, he makes us, and I don't mean beautiful just to look at. I mean, it's wonderful that we have each other, that we have love in our life, that we have someone to share it with, that when he made Adam, he made Eve, and he didn't let Adam be by himself. It's wonderful. There's so many beautiful things on this earth can you imagine what heaven's going to be like? I mean, I just can't imagine. So I'm excited. I'm very excited uh, for everyone who's went on that I know, and I'm excited to go there. Not, I'm not going to take my life because it's not my life to take. It's God's. I belong to Christ. When you are saved, you belong to Christ. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
and you are to spread his word. That's what you're here for. So, no, you shouldn't want to end your life to go to heaven, but you should want to tell everybody about it, okay? Let's say our prayers, because Chris will be driving up any minute. And, um, oh, and I mixed up a cake today from scratch without a hand mixer, without a uh, stand mixer, and because uh, I wanted to do my cake lesson while I'm here. And, uh, oh, my gosh, it's going to be so good. So the first, the next cake lesson video is going to be how to make a cake from scratch without nothing but a whisk. A microwave, now I did use the microwave. A whisk, a microwave, and a bowl. And um, and then the next one, I'm going to make some beautiful pedophores. With that cake, simple, where you can not spend hardly any money, do something really pretty for somebody, or an event, and make people think that you just did something really big, uh, and not hardly had to spend nothing because I'm not going to hardly use any um, equipment to do it. Okay? So, y'all remember that. Uh, remember about my new uh, site, too. I'm excited about it. It just reminds me of my mama. It reminds me of growing up with my mama. It reminds me. There's, there's plenty of bad memories I have of my mama, but there's a lot more good memories I have of my mama. And the, the reason I say that is because she was a um, prescription drug addict and alcoholic. And uh, lots of my family don't like for me to say that, but I don't care. There's alcoholics in every family. There's drug addicts in every family. And instead of pushing it under the rug, we need to let it be known so that they can get help. Another reason we should let it be known is that our children can see the fear of it. That we can teach our children that, that a lot of that stuff is, I believe it, um, what do you call it? Like, um, it runs in the family, in other words. What do you call it? You know what I'm talking about. Like, if you've got an alcoholic in your family, you should warn your children because if they never take the first sip, they'll never be the alcoholic. But if they take the first sip, they can. And I'm going to use President Trump right here. Whether you like him or not, one thing that's really good about the man is that, that his brother was an alcoholic and lost his life due to it. And President Trump has never drank a drop. And a lot of y'all probably think, oh, that can't be true. Well, I have never been drunk. And it's because of what I experienced growing up. Um, and I was determined that I was going to be in control of my mind. Another thing is I'm a type A and so is he. And a lot of people who are a type A personality want to be in total control of everything. That includes our mind. So we don't want to do a drug or do something that's going to hinder uh, the choices that we make. Now, with that said, we should warn our families if alcohol is in our family if drugs are in our family, um, I'll give you an example. Um, and I, and they might get mad at me, but I don't even care. But like Chris's family, they're almost perfect. There's hardly anybody in his family that's not. Uh, but there is one who has had a drug problem. I'm not going to tell you who it is, of course, but I never knew it ever until my kids were half grown. Um, so people sweep things under the rug and they don't let it be known. And to me, it should be known so that they're not ashamed, so that you can tell them you're sorry and tell them you'll encourage them and give them some kind of encouragement. Encourage their children, you know, uh, pat them on the back and say, I'm sorry this is happening in your family. We're praying for you. I mean, why does it have to be such a secret everywhere? That's just the older generation, and most of my viewers are older people. But y'all, it's not right. They think it's they think that you're being disrespectful, but you have to, um, in order to overcome something, um, it has to be addressed, and and it doesn't have to be addressed in the room. Which you, you know what I'm saying? It just needs to be talked about. So you should tell your kids it runs in your family. Just like our president, it ran in his family. He stayed away from it because he knows, and I know, that if I grab that alcohol and I take a drink, I got a 50-50 chance 
on, am I an alcoholic or not? And what if I am? Then what's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my kids? And wh what kind of a um, life are they going to have when they grow up? And it never goes away, y'all. Alcohol alcoholism and drug addiction is something that doesn't go away. So when a child is living in it at home, they're also going to marry and have to deal with the problem for the rest of their life. Even if it's a parent, if it's a child, it, if it's a parent and a child, if it's an immediate family, you are the ones who deal with it. Not the rest of the family, the cousins, the aunts and the uncles. They're not the ones in the house. You are. So um, they don't have a clue what it's like unless they've lived through it. And it's those very ones that want to give their opinion and be ugly about it when they don't have a clue what it was like. They didn't come to your aid, but then they want to shame you and tell you it's wrong. It's not wrong. There's nothing wrong about it. Because if I could steer anybody away from ever taking the first drink, if I could steer anybody away from not doing a drug. Now, I have been, I have to take prescription drugs, y'all, but I take them very sporadically. Like, I'll give you an example. I got a prescription drug before we went out for the show because I knew I'd be doing a lot more physical stuff. Um, and a matter of fact, I took them the first day and I couldn't think worth a flip on the show. And I know I can't tell y'all a lot about the show yet, but y'all know it's coming. Um, and so I couldn't take them the rest of the time. And not only that, but I dislocated my ribs at the doggone airport. So I went through a lot while I was out there and it was hard, but I, but I kept going. Okay. But I got a prescription back in, let's see, that was, sip, let's see. October, I think. And I didn't get another prescription until February. So that shows you, I only take them on days that I absolutely have to take them. Why am I like that? Would I like to take one every day? Yeah, because I feel like a million bucks and I could do, and I could run a marathon. Not really, but you know what I mean. But I could get out and do a lot more. But I don't because I don't want to be like my mama. Okay? I just don't. I don't want my kids to have to live through what I did. I don't want them to live through what I did as an adult. Here comes my husband, so I got to shut up. <laughs> But y'all, um, spread this word because I think it's good for people to know if I could change one person, even if that, if this is what they're doing and they don't realize it, uh, if I could just change one person, to me, it's worth telling. Uh, matter of fact, my husband's here. Uh, I talked to my mama about what happened and at the time her mind was good and me and her discussed it. And she personally didn't have a problem with it. So, to me, that's all that matters. Um, Y'all have a wonderful and blessed day. And I'm going to say our prayers and hope that God can help us. Because we are all are guilty. You know, um, a lot of people said it was shameful for me to say something. Let me say this. We're, we all should be ashamed for things we've done. There's not one of us any better than the next person. And if you look down on anybody because of what they've been through or what they're going through, if you look down on somebody that's addicted to drugs or alcohol or has affairs with women because they have some kind of security problem in their mind or they have a mental disorder like bipolar, if you look down on people, then you may as well look down on children that have cerebral palsy and different things like that because they're diseases, y'all. We don't look down on people for diseases. We don't look down on people for things that they've been through and things that they go through. Now, I'm not making excuses for them, but do you know what it all boils down to? Sin. Sin. If it weren't for sin, a lot of these things wouldn't happen. A lot of these things wouldn't take place. And so we do not look down on them. We love them and we build them up and we encourage them. And that's who we're supposed to be as Christians. If you for one second in your mind thought badly about, if you think badly about anybody, 
and for one second in your mind, then you should ask for forgiveness. Because you know what? Tomorrow, you could walk out the door and something happened in your life and things completely changed and you could find yourself in a position that you would have never dreamed you were in. Some of those people in the Bible that God used did that exact same thing. I mean, one of the men that loved Jesus the most gave him up to be crucified on a cross. I mean, if that don't bring tears to your eyes, nothing would. One of the men also denied him. That walked with him. We say we wouldn't deny him. This man walked with him. He seen his miracles. He seen everything he did, and he still denied him. Did God love him anyway? Absolutely. Did Jesus love him anyway? Absolutely. Jesus knew he was going to do it before he even did it. So don't look down on people for things like that. That's just ridiculous to me. I just can't even believe that people still think that way. I just It just blows my mind. So if you still think that way, if you're from the old school and you still think that way, then bless your heart. You really need to... To take a look at who you really are, because they, none of us worth flip really, except through Jesus Christ. He made us and makes us, gives us those fruits of the Spirit and makes us the person that we are, not us. Nothing about us. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. And we thank you for being able to talk together. We thank you for being able to be a group of people that come together to listen to your word. That love you enough that when I start reciting your scripture, we don't tune off the show. There's so many of them, God, that would watch me, hundreds of them, if I were cooking. But they're not interested in the things of God. And I feel sorry for each and every one of them. And for them, we should pray. We should pray for the people in the world who may even be saved, but aren't walking in as close to you as they ought to be because they are missing out on the joy that you bring. They are missing out on what life could really be like if they let you be a part of it. We pray for those who've lost loved ones. And we pray for those who are suffering through um, different things in their life and health issues that they would take the time out to, to see the good that you have brought them through their storm and see the beauty in the world and look forward to what you have for us in the everlasting heaven that you have made especially for us. And we thank you so much for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Bye, y'all. Love all of y'all. And um, I guess now i got to try to find something to make for my husband to eat for supper. We had a BLT for lunch. So um, I'm not going to cook fish because somebody wanted to see me do that live. And i got to do it when it's daylight outside. Or the lighting is not very good in here. Y'all have a blessed evening. And we'll see you later. And thanks for watching Real Southern Woman. Real Southern women and men love God. And we're not ashamed to say it. Bye, y'all.